following program is from NET, the National Educational Television Network. when you're ready. The white man is, is thinking in terms of violence and the kind of violence he's thinking is teaching the African also to think in terms of violence so that that is the only communication which I find between the two uh, different kind of peoples whereas it could have been a communication of uh, cooperation. It could have been a communication of uh, economic development in the interest of both sides. But unfortunately, I find that both sides think in terms of fighting each other, think in terms of the morbid fear they have for each other. Complete integration in South Africa is quite out of the question. You couldn't integrate South African, all politically, culturally, socially, and racially, into one mass. It's quite out of the question. It would lead to chaos, destruction, lawlessness, and all the evils which we know of uh, in this world. In its Changing World series, the National Educational Television Network presents the first of two hour-long essays on South Africa, The Fruit of Fear. What is it that fastens world attention on South Africa today? The widening gulf of fear between a white minority and a black majority? The reputed inhumanity of a white-dominated society? The golden prosperity of a modern industrialized nation, a booming economy at the tip of an essentially underdeveloped continent? In the first of this two-part South African essay, we shall pursue these questions and seek answers revealing the rhythm and texture of South African life. Exiled to a remote rural area, Chief Albert Lutuli, patriarch of South African nationalism, seeks freedom for his people. A Nobel Peace Prize winner, he is the embodiment of African dignity. In the position obtaining in South Africa, where you do have uh, the whites in control and then using their position really to deny African people certain rights, certain fundamental human rights, uh, that tends to build amongst the Africans, I hope that will not be the case, but a, 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 a frustration and to a certain extent hatred. I hope not, but there will be the tendency in that direction. It does not work to preserve all the values which we should, as civilized people, uh, try to have shared by all people. And uh, so frustration comes in, tensions come in, and dignity, the dignity of the human being, uh, suffers in the process. Most people in South Africa get their ideas about what black people think and feel from their servants or others who work for them in a dependent capacity.
I think they are satisfied with little. And we, Europeans, we are not satisfied with little. If they have their beer and their food and clothing, their streets, their hut, you know, they are very, very happy. I think uh, uh, if you can measure happiness, they are above us. I'm sure of that. Vast, monotonous black ghettos called townships ring all the large cities of South Africa. Although these new townships are depressingly drab in contrast with the attractive European residential districts, they cannot be called slums. Indeed, they are quite an advance from the old shanty towns which they have replaced. Of the 17 million people in South Africa, about one out of four is white. Most of the non-whites are indigenous black Africans. The government refers to them as Bantu. Other non-whites include people of mixed blood called coloreds and a small number of Asians. Africans from the rural areas have been flooding into the cities in ever-increasing numbers, providing a pool of cheap labor. This township is located 15 miles or more from downtown Johannesburg to ensure maximum separation and security for the white population. Frequent petty harassment by the police punctuates the rhythm of daily living. In the name of apartheid, Africans are subjected to the most humiliating form of segregation. Apartheid, which literally means apartness, is the official policy of separate development. Not all Africans in the townships live miserably, but whatever their physical state, apartheid means that all urban black Africans stand together, stripped of political and social rights. The right to vote, to own land, to travel freely, and even the right to keep one's family together. Anyone can be expelled if the authorities deem his presence undesirable. Endorsed out is the dreaded phrase. This woman's husband is a factory worker. His earnings are above average. But if he should lose his job, he and his family could lose their home and be shipped out of town. In any case, they are prohibited by law from ever owning the land they live on. Women who are newly arrived from the country quickly learn city ways from their neighbors. Many Africans today are completely urbanized. They are born, married, and die in townships. But even those families who have lived in the city for several generations are still treated under the law as migrants. On their wedding day, this handsome, sophisticated young couple are sadly aware of their particularly uncertain future. at a child's funeral are sorrowfully reminded that the only guarantee of permanent residence in a township comes after death for those who are fortunate enough to be buried there.
As Minister of Information, Frank Waring has the duty of explaining and justifying his government's policy of separate development. In South Africa, we are determined to develop our country in peace and goodwill with all sections of our people. We maintain that uh, integration in South Africa would set that back the whole progress of Western civilization. And the record shows that the Bantu in South Africa is better off than any other Bantu in the whole of Africa. We intend accelerating this progress so that uh, South Africa will be shown as a leader in the advancement of the Bantu in the whole of Africa. Shops and other businesses in the townships are owned and operated by Africans. Whites are prohibited from doing business there. On the other hand, black entrepreneurs are hemmed in by restrictive regulations and most importantly by lack of capital. As a result, white businessmen and officials are often bribed or taken in illegally as silent partners. The goods in this store are beyond the means of a good many township residents. You have a majority of people who are living just on the subsistence level. Uh, very, very many of whom, in fact, are living under the bread line. Nat Nakasa is a young South African journalist who left his country and came to the United States on an exit permit. That is to say, on a one-way ticket. And then you have a small minority of people who aren't on the subsistence level, who aren't living under the bread line, uh, who are in fact, um, by South African standards, um, quite comfortable and by continental standards, African standards, perhaps even affluent. These are people uh, who will drive around in motor cars, these are people who will have three meals a day, these are people who will dress um, uh, very expensively, uh, these are people whose children will get an education, um, these are people who will have money in the bank, who will feel a greater sense of security. This small class of relatively affluent Africans includes professional men and intellectuals as well as businessmen. Some of them accept and enjoy life as it is. Africans call them sellouts. One often hears white people in South Africa, especially the government, boasting that the Africans in South Africa have the highest standard of living. It should not be difficult to understand why this is so. If your slave master is a wealthy slave master, you are likely to be the kind of slave that does better, eats better, than the slave who is owned by somebody who is a, a poor slave master. For the government, to uh, compare the standard of living of South Africans with Africans in the weaker economies is absurd. An African risks his neck in front of a camera by talking frankly and critically to the outside world about conditions in his country. Kan Temba speaks for many who have been silenced. We included Mr. Temba's statement knowing that he is now safely in Swaziland. I can't accept apartheid because 
from the first principles, it does not allow a man to have an opportunity to contribute to the development of South Africa. And he's prepared to throw in everything he's got in order to make this country a viable country, a beautiful country. He'd like to make it another United States of America, but he doesn't know how because those that are, the bosses that are, won't give him a chance. We'd like to uh, organize a destiny together. But uh, the white man has got this psychological fear of uh, organizing life only in his own interest. I want uh, a cooperation, uh, a communication between two sets of people, even if they are different for whatever reasons they are different. I'd like us to live together. What we have had over the years is, um, <coughs> excuse me, have been two communities existing um, more or less side by side. You've had on the one side of the color line the white community and on the other the black community. For the white community you've had until recently a virtual democracy. Yet on the other side of the color line uh, you've had uh, fascist rule, really. People have been ruled uh, with an iron hand. People's liberties have been severely limited. The very personal and hum uh, human dignity of a single African is something much less taken into account or respected than that of a, a white person on the other side. But, of course, it is not possible to separate the two communities completely. So some of uh, the influence of the democratic institutions, which you find on the white side of the color line, it is true, have um, this influence has infiltrated uh, into the African community on the other side of the color line, the black side of the color line. A view from the other side of the color line is voiced by Professor Nicolas Olifier of Stellenbosch University. The day-to-day -day relations between white and non-white are far better than is usually presumed. People look at our statute books, at our laws, and think that because laws, some of them are discriminatory, therefore the relations, the day-to-day -day relations between white and non-white must of necessity be bad. My own experience has been that there, there is an immense amount of goodwill, of courtesy, of chivalry, of mutual assistance on the personal level. I believe that that will even increase in the future. And with the development of that understanding, and obviously with the removal of unnecessary pinpricks and frustrations and also the development of a sense of security in the white group that relations are bound to improve, to become even better than they are at present. Medical and social services which the whites provide for Africans are poor and inadequate in contrast with splendid modern facilities they reserve for themselves. It would be difficult to find a white beggar on the streets of Johannesburg.
A black African worker is often paid eight to twelve times less than a white man doing the same work. But unskilled jobs of this kind are generally reserved for Africans only. During the day, Africans are welcome to spend their money and work in the central section of the city. But before dark, these men must be off the streets and back in their townships. The nerve center of South Africa's booming economy is the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Here the investor may expect as much as 27% return on his money. There is no longer any poor white class in South Africa. As one of the last countries where the get-rich-quick dream can still be realized, Businessmen have made fortunes in a few years, which elsewhere would have taken decades to amass. The Breifleis is the South African equivalent of the American barbecue. A Breifleis can be anything from a simple family cookout to a Hollywood-inspired outdoor party. The uh, average native is a very good fellow, provided he's not interfered with from outside. I think the native uh, left to the people who know how to handle them is certainly he's a fine fellow. Uh, I've had no trouble. I, quite frankly, I haven't prosecuted one single boy. There was no need for it. Europeans adjust to this style of lavish living, reassuring each other that it is not a privilege, but a right. Much more than that. South Africa is disliked yes. in the outside world. And they don't see the other picture, the lovely picture. In this country, we are worrying too much about the native question. I think that they are enjoying more privileges than many other people in the rest of the world. We are treating them very well up to their standards. Afrikaners, descendants of early Dutch settlers, have a rational and convincing spokesman in Scott Pinar, assistant editor of the newspaper De Burger. We arrived in South Africa three centuries ago, more than three centuries ago. 
That was more or less the same time that the um, modern Americans arrived in, in America. Nobody has any difficulty in identifying America as a nation with a right to America. But the world seems to have a great difficulty in granting us the same right in Africa. The problem probably is that we are on a black continent, we are not black, we are white. If we were to have been a black people, there would have been no trouble. The world would have granted us our right of staying right where we are and enjoying the rights that all other nations have. If only the world would concede as this point that we are a nation here and that we do have rights here, then the deadlock will be solved. Novelist Alan Payton, head of the one-man, one-vote Liberal Party, disagrees passionately with Afrikaner nationalist reasoning, well, it, but he does not underestimate its force. See, people who imagine that um, the problems of South Africa are going to be solved without taking Afrikanerdom into account, I don't think they understand what they're talking about. Now, you ask me what Afrikanerdom is. Well, People came out here from Europe. They came out to a country which offered them freedom, which was quite unknown to them in Europe. They moved further and further north until white people were eventually in command of the whole country up to the, up to the Limpopo River. The Bushmen melted away and the Hottentots melted away. But um, it was when he met the black man, especially because the black man was numerically superior to him. And that fear is very deep in the Africa. But uh, fundamentally, Afrikaner was determined to ensure his own survival and his own security. In recent years, it ceased to be purely Afrikaner security and Afrikaner safety. It's now become white security and white safety. That is the reason why so many English-speaking people, even if they don't support the Nationalist Party, support in general the policy of separate development. If you agree with the end, and if you think that someone else can achieve the end, then you tend to become less critical of his methods, and that's exactly what's happened here. Most white people are unwilling to disturb their very comfortable way of life by taking the risk of speaking out although they may be fully conscious of the injustice around them. The voices of liberal-minded whites carry almost no weight in opposition to the white consensus of convenience. Women's protest organizations, such as the Black Sash, are tolerated by the government as harmless pinpricks. But dedicated members like Doris Hill are relentless in their criticism. Well, I feel that really the issue in South Africa is essentially a moral issue. But you know, it's very difficult to get people to face up to moral issues. And really our whole attitude towards the African people in this country, all the people of color, is basically, I think, a moral issue. We want to use them. We have an economy which depends on them. And yet, we don't want to treat them like human beings and give them those basic things in a society which make for happiness, which make for prosperity. We all know under other circumstances that if people live in slums and people don't have rights, if they don't have a good family life, a closely welded family, all able to live together, that you get crime, you get troubles of all kinds. But somehow in South Africa, we don't seem to realize this. And our African people who live in the urban areas live unnatural lives. People don't think of the problems of their servant, for example, who can't live with her husband because she's working for you in a house, her husband is somewhere else, she can't live with him. Her children are scattered. People don't think of this in terms of, it happened to me, how would I feel about it? And they tend to think of them as something different, just a group of people. And this is something which frightens me very much because although many white South Africans don't realize it, this influences you as a person. 
and I think you become less human, you tend to slur over the moral issues and just live your comfortable life, because life is very comfortable in South Africa. Nowhere is life more comfortable than on the beach at Cape Town. It was Cape Town's harbor and its fertile shorelands which attracted the first European settlers. The majority of the population in the Cape province are classified by the government as coloreds. They are people of mixed descent, principally African, European and Malay. A century ago, they enjoyed many political and social rights, including broad voting powers. Today, the official status of the coloreds is only a little above that of the black Africans. Cape Town is the legislative capital of the country and a world-renowned resort where white South Africans and tourists gather at the seaside to worship the sun and the human body. <laughs> 